the three things that really stuck out at me when I was running this webinar were, you know, James has done a few pricing transitions, acquisitions in his time. So that'd be really good to kind of talk about. Self-licensing is a big one. James has kind of uh, planned this one out fairly meticulously. But I think the real thing that I've always been impressed with when it comes to James is the volume of people he knows, but not just knows, he's got a good reputation and how he's gone about that. So with absolutely no more delay, let's, uh, let's jump this on. Let's get James up and running. Participants, move over here. Unmute. <clears throat> Tickety boo. There's oh, there's a big groan start oh. today. Oh, James, how are you? I'm good, man. Let's get your uh, video going. Okay. There we go. There you go. What a how great vantage point. I feel like I feel like I'm I don't know like uh, Andre the Giant or Tony Robbins. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, you should have a camera looking down at you, right? So it doesn't true, look up. Yeah. So that's you don't want to go like that. So if you go like that, it's like hi. So, so I've got a, I've got my stand-up desk, and I've got the camera sort of looking down at me. So it's a, going to be more flattering, apparently. Tell it, a stand-up desk are interesting one. I've actually got one in front of me. Mm. Uh, what, I love them. What They're was great. the motivator for you to get one? Uh, where did you get it? And, and uh, so yeah, I uh, guess what, what, what has it? What has it been? Has it changed things? I've got one of those very desks, so you just yeah. you can, it sits on top of your normal desk, and you just pull it up. Um, and I probably spend I reckon about half the day standing up now, which I, I, yeah. I think is well apparently is meant to be better for you. And uh, and I actually think you are slightly more productive when you're stood up than sitting down. I feel like yeah. you're, you're sort of ready to do something. So um, no, I just uh, a friend of mine had one, and um, I was just intrigued. I thought, well, let's have a look at that, and. Um, you know me, bright, shiny things, new things, different things. So I sort of uh, grab one and to have a look back. It's been great. So really enjoying and, it. And you've obviously set up your background for webinars because you've got the books and, and the golf clubs, which is always a good look. Oh, uh, yeah. Golf bag, <laughs> yes. Don't play much golf at the moment, but never mind. No, well, I can see there's no clubs in it. So <laughs> that kind of puts that to pay. So, man, we've got a lot of ground we could cover. And you and I chatted about this. So I thought yeah. we'd approach this with a bit of a timeline approach. Okay. Um, but I know most people on the, on, on the webinar will kind of know you, they'll have met you, but give, give a bit of, just in case, you know, we don't, because sometimes we, we talk to people and we don't necessarily have the background information. Yeah, okay. Give people a bit of the, the background around. <laughs> Jeffrey says, what's for the glasses, James? Do you think you're bonnet? No, I just, yeah. I have to wear them now. See, once you get over 40, it's just <laughs> down. It's only, Jeffrey, they're new Jeffrey, this year. Jeffrey should know this. Jeffrey should know this about. <laughs> um, I've got a great joke about Bono. It's what's the difference between God and Bono? God doesn't think he's Bono. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, enough of this. Give me a bit of give people a bit of background about Millhaven, what it's all about, who it works with, um, just the the, the the you know yeah. the business profile. Uh, so, uh, based in Pimble on the North Shore of Sydney, uh, six staff, two ARs, uh, really providing holistic full holistic advice to clients of varying ages. We do span quite a big demographic, um, but I would say the sweet spot is probably those 40 to 65 year olds that tend to sit in that box, tend to be a bit of a skew towards self-managed super funds. Um, okay. And that's probably due to what we did in the early stages of the business. Uh, and it's probably less of a skew towards that now, uh, but it's still a big part of what we do. Um, okay. Yeah, so that's pretty much it in a nutshell. So Beautiful. FIFA service, so FIFA service uh, on insurance as well now. Yeah. Uh, so uh, so a couple of things we've transitioned to that over the last twelve months, which has been interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, I suppose a general move towards that independent box, even though we can't call ourselves independent. Yeah. So uh, that that's uh, I suppose where we are and where we're going at the moment. Okay. So let's talk about the timeline because we've got plenty to work with. And I think we'll jump onto some of these questions around if you're comfortable with self-licensing, pricing, mm, experience, sure. BT Select and a whole bunch of stuff as we go. But let's start with the beginning. How did, how did, you, how did Millhaven come about? What was, the, what was the, the moment at which you went, I'm going to start my a, a financial planning business? Uh, so January 2006, mm -hmm. um, I was working as a power planner for another business, power planner stroke advisor, associate advisor for a business in Silverwater in Sydney. Um, and they were particularly not very good at financial advice. Okay. Um, I, I take no part in that. 
obviously, uh, but uh, they uh, ethically were, you know, not where I, I was ethically. Uh, so morally, mm -hmm. I, I felt that wasn't the right fit for me going forward. So I thought, look, I can do better in this. Uh, and I had some experience running a business before in the UK. So I had some business background. Okay. And I, I, you just get to a point where you think, well, if I don't do it now, I don't think I'm ever going to do it. So I, I sort of uh, made the leap. Um, I had two clients that were adamant they wanted to come with me. Okay. Um, even though I said, look, ethically, you know, I can't really take you, but they were adamant they wanted to come. Okay. One, one was a uh, sort of uh, a 50, mid 50s couple. The other one was a geriatric specialist doctor. Yeah. And uh, so we started with two clients in from my garage, basically. <laughs> so wow. as as um as all great large companies apparently start from garages in in various different places. Okay. Mm, so and, uh, sorry, keep going. Yeah. So uh, and that that was it. So I just had my first uh, child about okay. nine, nine months before that. So perfect time to start a business mortgage. Amanda just decided. Oh, Amanda decided that she, she wasn't going to go back to work, and I decided to start a new business. So that was sounds, awesome. sounds very very familiar. Yeah. Um, just I, you've actually had a really interesting career before you became a financial planner. Uh, thing I always thought you're actually pretty good at the whole. Anyway, there's anyway, there's anyway, anyway, right. So I was. Uh, so my father's an auctioneer. My brother's an auctioneer. We're also. Right. Um, we actually specialised in. We had an insolvency business in the UK. So I spent eight yep. years in insolvency and bankruptcy before coming to Australia. So I had a, I suppose, a pretty interesting learning curve from a business point of view, um, yep. sort of obviously headed up by my father who taught me absolutely amazing amount about business and what not to do, mainly because yep. we were seeing that every day of what not to do. Yep. So that was uh, quite an interesting, um, quite an interesting training ground. And, and look, when I came to Australia, I, I just felt that after eight years of uh, watching people lose things, I thought mm -hmm. perhaps I should do something a bit more positive and help people gain things. <laughs> so, Poacher so, turned gamekeeper. <laughs> that's it. So it was, uh, yeah, but it was, it was a great training ground. Great training ground. Now, we've actually spoken a bit about sort of insolvency and people may have the perception that it's about, you know, big guys in in. in puffer jackets going in with knuckle dusters but it's, yeah, a it's, not, it's, it's a bit of that but there's another side to it isn't there yeah i mean it's actually believe it or not it's actually more about helping people than you think uh, everyone think it's quite a negative but th th there's a whole uh, process to the insolvency business that um, is very much around trying to get people out, out of situations they found themselves in so it, it's far more constructive than people think it is the process mm. having said that you know, there are some insolvency practitioners out there that are less than nice about the way they go about things, and that's okay. Yeah. Uh, but we, yeah, we, we found it, even though it is quite just sad for a lot of people, it, is, it can be quite a constructive process if you, if you know what you're doing. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was going to ask, so, so tell me a bit about, you obviously left your existing employers because there was a, a principles, a clash of principles. Yep. And I imagine when most people do that, they start a business with a very clear idea of this is what I don't want to be. And the business starts growing in that way. So give me a bit of a picture of the early days of Millhaven. What were the, the principles you built it upon and, and how do they translate into the, you know, those, those early years of building a business? Yeah, I think I was pretty idealistic when I started. I think I probably was a bit naive in terms of the industry in Australia as well at that time, okay. um, only because I, I came over from the UK in 2002. So I was relatively new to the Australian way of life. And I think yep. that, so I was a little bit naive about that, I think, to start with. And mm -hmm. I had, you know, you know, designs of grandeur in terms of holistic practices and only dealing with certain types of clients. But the reality is that it doesn't work like that. When you start with two clients, you pretty much have got to make money from day one. So I think the initial stages were quite transactional. We did build some ongoing clients absolutely straight off the bat. Um, but it was um, very much a, a very steep learning curve for the first 12 to 24 months um, yep. until we, you know, we got through that first wall, if you know okay. what I mean. So it's just about getting critical mass and just having enough to pay the bills and, and do what you need to, to do. And then, of course, we had the GFC straight after that. So. Yeah, wouldn't that hit about that hit pretty soon, right? 
Well, the first one was, so Bears went September 07 and then Lehman's was a year later, wasn't it, basically? Yeah. So um, it was, uh, yeah, it was, I, I always joke that um, we were licensed and we just, just become licensed under AXA at that point. And I always laugh because AXA run out of insurance PDSs at that point. So <laughs> more advisors selling insurance during the GFC than anything else. So, wow. um, but it was a really interesting time. But actually it was ironically, and a lot of the other advisors on will know this from their experiences. We found the client engagement during that period was really good. Uh, obviously people are, are worried and they want to talk to someone about it. And, um, we found some of our best clients were built off those conversations at that particular time. So, yep. which is really interesting. So perfect. Mm. So is there any, are there any particular stories that jump out when you talk about sort of the, the hard learning or, 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 or the lessons you learned along the way? Um, well, certainly when we, we started to get some referral sources pretty early on from some account, accountant, particularly I was working with, um, and this is really where our specialization in self-managed super funds started. Yeah. Uh, and hence why we had a bit of a skew towards that in the early days and probably even so now and really how I learned everything I did about self managed super fund I learned pretty quickly yeah. um, and continued to learn but um, we I think that one of the first SMSFs we got referred was um, a business owner who had a bed and breakfast he had another caravan park in an investment trust and was trying to buy a third caravan park in mission beach with an unrelated yeah. party in a self-managed super fund okay but also wanted to sell his other caravan park using the 15 year cgt small business relief yeah. i think i did five soas for him to get it where it needed to be I think holy it moly it was just off the chart the power plan i was working with at the time i i had to buy a, like the biggest bunch of flowers at the end of it just <laughs> The amount of work she spent doing it was just absolutely amazing. So, what, was, what was the lesson you learned from that in particular? How did it imp impact the uh, way that you proceeded I, from that point onwards? I certainly undercharged for that. I learned to okay. charge better after that, uh, only because I, you know, you leap into things because you you want the deal. But um, I certainly learned that you've got to charge appropriately for the advice that you give. But that's part of the learning curve, right? So yeah. So what um, I'm really interested, because this is, this is one of the advice that I think Peter Thiel gives to, uh, in one of his, his, his books. He talks about the fact, I think it's a zero to one. He talks about that the biggest mistake that early stage businesses make is not charging enough. And the problem is when you're an early stage business, you need the, you need the revenue and the profit more than uh, a later business because you've got to invest in the marketing, you've got to build the team, you've got to build everything from scratch. Um, nah, that's probably true, but it's hard. It is hard when you're trying, you know, if you don't have any money behind you, it depends how much money you got behind you, I think. If you've got a, you know, a, an investment pool that you're utilizing to build a business, like some of these startups do, I think you can be quite, you know, dogmatic about what you do in terms of charging. I think if you, for us, it was really about, I had to earn a, you know, I was growing a business to earn a salary, basically at that yeah. point. So I had, yeah. you just got to do what you do. So I think it depends on where you're coming from, but it is true. That you know, if I look back now, I think some of the clients I took on then, uh, I probably would have been better off not taking on from <laughs> an efficiency point of view, um, and from a profitability point of view. But that's to be honest, I think you've got to go through that to learn from it. And that, you if you do everything right the first time, you're never going to learn anything. So, I think that's really important. You've got to make the mistakes. So. So what year was this when you, you sort of had that, that, that might be a period of time where you suddenly went from realizing that, you know what, I'm, I'm undercharging and I've got to get better at, at really um, charging more. And yeah, what, what, year, what year are we talking about? Oh, probably 2008. It's really okay. back off the back of the, the GFC. And um, yeah. uh, obviously, there was a lot, a lot of firefighting throughout the GFC, obviously in terms of clients and making sure that they were all good. Um, but off the back of that, it was really about, we were doing a lot in that self-managed super fund space and we were trying to charge appropriately for that. Um, but it was early days in the self-managed super fund stuff. I mean, self-managed yeah. super funds have been around since the 50s, right? They're not, they're not a new thing. Um, but as soon as the government changed that legislation, that section 67A of the CIS Act in September 07 in regards mm -hmm. to property, yeah. That was the catalyst for the growth of self-managed super funds, right? And it really, yeah. really did escalate from everyone wanted one. So, 
I had this yeah. conversation when I was in the US and I was like, we were hearing from a lot of people about the US, as you know, are very investment focused. Mm. And I've often wondered about that, whether the Australian focus on property and the US focus on investments is to do with the fact that the Australian dream is, you know, the quarter acre block on the corner, whereas the American dream has always been, you know, Wall Street, Gordon Gecko, the, the billionaire on a yacht. So I don't know if there's anything in that, but um, there's definitely a different focus. Oh, don't get me started on house prices, please. <laughs> we'll be here for two hours. So, uh, I, I, yeah, like, I just think it's been, you know, we, we, this, the last 24 years have been an amazing run for property generally. Uh, and there's been a whole bunch of reasons for that. It's not just one thing or another. Um, and I think uh, Self-Managed Superfund just provided another vehicle for that to happen within. And that, that was really what happened off the back of that. So, so let's, let's sort of move it forward a bit. And let's, let's move into kind of a discussion about two things which kind of go together, I think, in your world. Pricing, pricing transition specifically, and acquisition. So when, did, when was your first, like, structured pricing transition? And, all, and uh, how did that – and I guess when was your first tra- acquisition proper? Uh, so the first acquisition was a pretty small one. It was actually an actor advisor that passed away. Um, and we actually, uh, I think it was like $70,000 of revenue. It was pretty small um, okay. in the grand scheme of things. And most of it was insurance. There was quite a lot of insurance in there. He was an old risk okay. writer. Yep. That passed away. Um, we took that, took that over. Um, okay. And look, uh, what we, we do whenever we do an acquisition is – and you've been through this process with us, so you understand yep. this. It's really getting in top in front of the, the hot 50 list, as you call it, um, and getting in front of those clients as quickly as you possibly can. Okay. Um, the fir- I think the first thing is to make them obviously comfortable with who you are and what you're doing. And, and this is going to sound very, um, it's going to sound bad, but the unfortunate thing, you know, obviously with the, the advisor passing away, it actually mm-hmm. gave us a, a really good story to tell in terms of why we were taking over <laughs> the business. And uh, that sounds terrible, but it, it's true. Um, you know, they, they all respected Gordon and liked him a lot. And we were that natural succession for that. Um, so I think the story is really important. What story yep. are you telling in terms of why you're taking on? Uh, yep. I think sometimes when advisors sell businesses, it can be, it can be a bit demoralizing for the clients. Oh, they've just dumped me. You know, they've solved the business, uh, solved the business, and, and just dumped me on you as as the new advisor. So I think yeah. the story, having that story correct, is really really important in that first in that early stage, and getting that message out to clients as soon as you can. Now it's really it's a lot easier now than not not easier now, but there's far there's lots of different types of media you can use to get that message out now. So for now, we would use sort of video now. We we wouldn't yeah. do an email now. Um, uh, but then it was about emails and letters, to be honest. At that right, point. gotcha. So and that hot 50, 50 that's, okay. that's the key. A hot 50, hot 50, not hot so list, cool. <laughs> and um, what year was this, just, just out of interest, James? Uh, this would have been 08, 09. 08, okay, yeah. 2008 and 09. Yeah. Beautiful. And, yeah, so we tried yeah. to get in front of those clients um, and then transition as many as we can, uh, as many as we could to a holistic model. Now, some of them okay. came on that journey. Some of them didn't. Some of them stayed where they were. In fairness, um, you know, obviously the insurance ones were, you know, there were some opportunities there. Others just remained with the product that they particularly had at that juncture. But it's been interesting because they've obviously continued to sit on our database. We continue to obviously service them, you know, certainly the insurance ones with information and as we go forward. And, and ironically, you, you do tend to get referrals or, new things happening with those clients, which ultimately turn into other types of clients going forward. So and it's, it's interesting because we had a look at your pipeline not that long ago, and we started to recognize that there were a few different triggers that were coming up. And particularly for those ones, I remember that one of the biggest triggers was they were, they were phoning up to cancel their, their policies. Yeah, but it, uh, that's true. Um, uh, we're find we're finding that, you know, as, as clients get older, that those, policies get really expensive, right? So mm-hmm. it's important that uh, you continue to look at those on an annual basis. So. But that flipped across into a conversation about, hold on, before you cancel those policies, why don't we just have a look and see if we can get you the same level of cover a little bit more efficiently and effectively, which kind of yeah turned into uh, a discussion, which turned into an engagement. 
you got to and you got to let clients know what you do i mean it's amazing the amount of clients we still even though we we do a lot of we still send stuff out all the time to clients mm. telling them what we do they still come back to us sometimes and say, oh, i didn't know you did that <laughs> I said, well, so, we've been telling you for like five years, but you know, so but that's okay because people, you know, it's not, perhaps not front of mind for them that time. So, so how do you tell? Like, we're sort of jumping around a bit, but how? How? What are the means by which you are consistently telling people what you do in a way that they don't know? What are the avenues that you use? So now it's really about videos now, and and um, and obviously, uh, really educating the client as part of the review process also. So um, when we're going through the review process with a client is obviously just letting, just reminding them of the key things that they need to do. Now, generally we're trying to cover all the, all the bases when we do a review anyway. So yeah. we've been, an example of that recently has been, we're getting a whole heap of uh, clients re-looking at estate planning stuff because they haven't looked at it before or yeah. it hasn't been front of mind. So we're doing a fair bit on that. Now that's a really interesting, it's not particularly profitable but it's an interesting conversation with clients to really get deep on what they want to do going forward. And it's a, it's a, it's a conversation on a different emotional level to the yep. normal conversation you have. But so I actually think it's really, really good for that advisor client relationship because it does take you to a slightly different level from a conversation point of view. Well, they talk about, I mean, there's elements of any, any, any product line or any, you know, and I talk about product in a sense that advice, and the relationship is essentially the product that, you, that, that we're selling. It's not the product is in the financial product, but there are things in there which are, you know, uh, going to be significant value adds in terms of the, the tangible metrics. And there's other things which are going to be significant emotional value adds. And some of them are going to make people stick around and some of the other ones that are going to, people are going to come to you for. Yeah. And I don't know what your view is, but I've always thought if you, if you deal with new clients at the top of your funnel with the things they want, and then later on introduce the things that they're likely to take because they trust your word and or you know they're willing to sort of listen at that point then it's a much better way than trying to sell everything at the top of your funnel and finding out that you know that you don't get traction because it's too much burning issues right exactly burning issues first and then worry about the other stuff later on yeah and i think that certainly more so now than ever i think it's about that clients often don't know what they don't know. So you're better off dealing with what they do know right now and what they're worried about right now. Let's yeah. get some plan in place to, to really get that, you know, that, uh, that monkey off your back. And then from there, build consensus in terms of what you plan to do for the longer term. Um, yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about the other transitions that you've made. Let's list, list them out or get an idea of when they happened and the acquisitions as well. Um, so the other acquisitions, uh, another purchase, we small purchase we did in 2011. Okay. And then we did one 12 months ago, but that was really, really small. Okay. One that was like a 30 grand that was a back end of a, another book that was being sold somewhere else. And we only really took that on because he was in Queensland business and there was a, a spattering of clients in New South Wales. So we took yep. them. From that. So that's it. Um, all of which we've sort of gone through that similar process of getting in front of those clients as quickly as we can, getting our message across. And, and by the way, th th we can do this better all the time. We're still working on all this. It's, it's never perfect. Um, uh, but yeah, so we continue to do that. In terms of pricing, um, well, we went through a bit of a pricing rejig uh, about 18 months ago. Um, okay. But I, it's interesting with the pricing one because I actually think it's, um, I, I know you're quite keen on doing pricing. You almost have to do it yearly, if you maybe every two years, because I think it depends on where your business is and what your expenses are and what your EBIT is you're running at. Um, because that, that has an absolute effect on what you potentially charge for specific processes in your business, right? So. Yeah, I, I think um, Craig sort of said to me the other day, he's like, uh, it's, it's interesting, a lot of people, they, they go looking for leads, I need to go bring leads in, I'm going to grow my revenue. And when you actually sit down and break it down with them, you realize that leads are the last thing they need. What they need to do is they need to make sure their existing book is more profitable, uh, possibly even, you know, lose a few clients uh, who aren't and then free yourself up the time whilst, uh, you know, it's actually the, 
the levers between increasing your fees and the number of drop-offs is actually very favorable to the increasing fees element. So for some yeah. people, it's, you know, Jim Stackpole, I think, has this saying, if you're, if you're too busy, there's every chance you're, you're probably too cheap. And whether you agree with Jim's model or not, there is definitely you know, a word to be said in it. And, and I think now, because we've uh, obviously just got our own license, we will probably go through that process again. And, uh, you know, I mean, what do they say to, so to improve is, is to change and to be perfect is to change often. And I think sometimes you've got to, you've sort of got to do that. You've, you've got to continually change. I know I get, crit- I do get criticized by my wife, particularly for changing stuff all the time, but <laughs> I think the important is that, you know, if it's not right and it does need tweaking or changing, you've got to do it. And whether that's pricing or anything within the business, um, it's important to do that. So, so uh, I'm, I'm, t- I'm, I'm sure I remember there was another pricing transition in there earlier on than that. Uh, I mean, there certainly was in terms of fit when we, when we stopped, I suppose, in the, uh, early on when we, we really stopped taking any form of commission at all. Um, and yeah. that went for that to f- flat fee for service, which was around that 09 time. Um, and we basically said ongoing now, holistic advice, fee for service, yeah. uh, upfront fee, flat fee ongoing, bang, that's it. And um, we were still uh, doing commissions on insurances then, but very yeah. much the commissions were, we agreed upon that most of our commission structure was going to be level going forward. Yeah. Um, and, and although that hits your cash flow, it is obviously long term, potentially better, yep. uh, but obviously it's difficult at that stage. But yeah, so there was a, a flat fee transition around that 09 time, so okay. no commissions at all. Absolutely beautiful. So I guess I wanted to ask three things on the pricing and transition thing, which is mm. uh, give us a bit of an idea of you think what what are the things that if people want to successfully move their clients from typically a lower fee to a higher fee and one that's, that's, that's actually more commercially viable. What are the, I want to ask this in three parts. What are the biggest tips you'd give for getting it right? What was the pricing structure you, you moved to? Um, and finally, uh, I want you to talk a little bit about fee, like insurance as well, because that's kind of a, mm. uh, a bit of a thing. So first thing off the bat, like what, what's your tips for getting this right? If you, if you do do the numbers and you realize, holy moly, I've got, you know, I'm unprofitable in, in, in significant areas. I, I think the first thing to probably mention is that advisors are probably their own worst enemies in terms of pricing. Um, and what yeah. I mean by that is, and I'm absolutely guilty of this and have been before, is saying, oh, they won't pay that, so I'm not going to ask for it. Yeah. And um, it's just not true. Uh, and, and you've really got to look at... So I think the my first bit is you've got to be really honest with your clients and you've got to be absolutely straightforward. Uh, But there's no point being honest and straightforward and putting up your prices unless you've got something to offer them off out off the back end. So part of that is before you actually go through that, that asking, you know, taking them through that pricing thing is really getting a clear understanding of what they want from the service. So I made the mistake of assuming that I knew exactly what clients wanted from us. Yeah. And I don't think that's true. I think okay. <laughs> so. I think you've got to really because some clients want unbelievably specific things. It's quite bizarre sometimes, but it's, um, but you know they're very much about. You'll you'll be surprised when you ask those questions about yep. what they come back with. Um, for some of my older clients, it, it really is. They just want someone to look up, almost look after them, make sure they don't do anything silly. Okay. For, other, for other clients, it's about, I do not have any time. You're running this. Yeah. Can we, can we dive into that? Like, is there yeah. an example or a story you can tell us about that would demonstrate how you went about finding this out? And maybe, you know, one of the, one of the conversations which completely challenged what you believed. Um, yeah, so I was, um, I've, I, so I've got a, an elderly client. She's, she's probably late 70s um, and she's got a pretty big portfolio that we look after. And for her, I, honestly, it, I always go to her because she, she it saves her coming in the office. And, and for her, it's almost like she just needs to make sure that someone is looking after her money mm-hmm. and, and someone will come around and go through that with her for 10 minutes. You spend 10 minutes going through the portfolio and 50 minutes drinking tea and talking yep. about what, uh, so for her, it's, it's a, it's a peace of mind thing. Absolutely. Is that, 
Um, my geriatric doctor I look after, I have to stand on the ward to get him to sign stuff. <laughs> yeah. Because but... he has no time. Right? So, so it, they're the completely different ends of the spectrum in terms of, of, of what, that, what they are. Now, um, interestingly with the doctor, I, I had to charge him a bit of a project fee recently for some work that we've done. And I thought, well, we're already charging him a fair, fair bit of, he, he's not, but it was a, a legitimate amount of work we had to do for this product. So it's not yep. going to pay that. And I literally put it in front of him and he thought, he said to me, and I, I thought it would be more. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought, mm, there you go. I've just learned something else today. Um, but look, generally it was priced correctly. We've done it generally. So I, I think we're often the barriers to the pricing stuff, not the clients. Yep. And I, I think we've got to get out of that. And, and I, I'm constantly trying to do that to make sure that I'm being, um, pretty strict with myself and not assuming too much of the client. I, I think you first got to believe that, you know, what you do is worth that fee to start with. Sure. And I think that come, for me, that comes down to looking at the underlying numbers and actually understanding what it costs you to, you know, what it costs you to turn up and open the doors and employ the people. But equally importantly, I think it's important to understand um, what you're not paying yourself, what you're not rewarding yourself. Because often that's the case. You look at it and realize that, you know what, you're not actually paying your best employee enough. <laughs> Yeah. Um, as well as once you've done that, actually getting a story and a way of talking to people about what you do, which you're comfortable, you know, because you've, you've, you've told it a few times and it, and it accurately reflects how you sort of view the business and what you do. If you don't have that, it's really hard. And I think you've got to be comfortable saying no. I've got a lot better at saying no over yeah. the last 10 years. So um, we had one recently, a client saying, you know, he wanted to run his, his portfolio and he wanted us to run a bit. And I just said, I'm sorry, we just yeah. can't do that. It's just because I know it's going to be a headache. And it, it, it's, just, it's better off not to do that because you end up not making any money out of those clients anyway. So, um, the way I like to think about it is I've got a, it's, it's not about me, it's about the, the system that I've built and the business behind it. And if someone comes in and says, hey, I want to do something different, I've really got to represent the system and turn around and say, I'm not sure that this, you know, that's going to help, help you to do it. That's just not the way we work. And that, for me, it's a much easier way to think about clients because it almost takes your own ego out of the equation yeah it becomes a bigger thing right yeah absolutely so. can you would you mind sharing your structure how you charge how you came up with it yeah so um we obviously have i suppose different offerings for different clients like everyone does we generally mm -hmm. charge a um we, we did uh, look at changing the way we charge in terms of uh, spreading it out over a 12 month period. So mm -hmm. we can do that with clients. Now we, we give them the option of, to do that, but generally obviously we're charging up from fee to the project fee to do the plan. Um, and then we, we, we then charge that on, ongoing fee thereafter. Okay. Um, now we, since we've got our own license, we've, we've, we've sort of split the, we've changed the way we've done the pricing slightly whereby now we have a flat fee for the strategy work. Okay. Uh, which is, uh, and, and that's charged uh, to the client. And then we have a small portfolio fee we charge for the portfolio work. Now, okay. the reason for we've done that is there'll be those clients you can still give strategy advice to even if they don't have a portfolio. Yep. Um, and those that then do have a portfolio, you're just making sure you're being remunerated for the risk you're potentially taking on in that portfolio. Um, with those clients and obviously paying for the, uh, the investment committee and that side of the process as well. So, and it is a small, it's point, we charge 0.3. So it, it's, okay. it, it's a small percentage on top, um, okay. but it's, it's specifically designed for that. So um, basically three offers we have and they vary obviously. Uh, and, and we're just uh, trying to put in a, a sort of a low level digital offer, um, yeah. which is, is something that, people can sort of uh, sign up to and get a limited amount of advice, um, which is going to cost us very little and will be done effectively remotely. Um, okay. But we'll then get them onto that whole journey that might be a very small thing we do from the first and we, and we market to them accordingly as they, as they grow their wealth. So. Cool. I think you're going to enjoy the accelerator, James. I've got some, oh, good. got some good stuff that'll fit nicely in there. Nice. Um, so what, and up from that, you've got the digital offer on the bottom end. How does it, how does it scale up? Yeah. So, um, and then it goes to three ninety five a month for the next yeah. one and then six ninety five, and then the top one 
it's about eight ninety five a month. Okay. So Enough. generally, so the six. So if, if you've got a self managed super fund, for example, you can't be on the three ninety five. Okay. You know, you know. So we it's done on entities as well. Um, uh, Jeff says roughly how much for your flat fee, if you don't mind. Would you mind sharing? Uh the upfront. Yeah. Uh, somewhere between two seven fifty and about four two. Okay. Do you ever go above that? Uh, for specific clients, we will, yeah. If, if you've got a really big client or that was doing a, a, an inordinate amount of work for, yes, absolutely, okay. would. Cool. And then 0.3% <laughs> on the portfolio, yeah. Okay, cool. That, that caps but, uh, out at five mil, by the way. Cap, caps out at five. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay, perfect. And then if you were to do some additional work for clients, mm -hmm. is that included in your ongoing service or is it additional or is it included for some and not for others? Depends what it is, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and we were having this discussion this week. Uh, you know, for those, that, so for the doctor one, I was just telling you about that was a specific um, uh, project we did for him because uh, some some mess he's got himself into um, yep. that we're helping him with. Uh, yep. That was very much off the reservation in terms of normal advice. So we charged him on an hourly basis, basically. Um, okay. So we bill him, we're billing him monthly at the moment based on the work that we do on an hourly basis. Okay. Um, so that's very specific um, yeah. for, for normal clients. I think it depends what, so at the moment we've got a few clients on the ongoing offer uh, that we've now changed license and we've decided, we've decided to move them for our efficiency purposes. Yep. Now I think that's on us and I don't necessarily think the client should pay for that because okay. I've decided to do it, not them. Um, yep. I think if it's something that they've decided to do from an advice point of view and it's specific then we potentially would charge a project fee on top most of the okay. time if it's if it's run-of-the-mill stuff changes within the port you know portfolios or even if it's small stuff that we have to do as an additional we'll just incorporate that within the review process Perfect. so, so you, you make it based on a call but ultimately if it's outside of the realm of, of yeah. or you'll charge a fee and it, otherwise if it's unknown work it's an hourly rate yeah so good good ones are like big inheritance stuff coming in or work you've got to do on that. So that can potentially be quite a lot of work depending on what you're doing. So sure. Sure. Uh, insurance. I think you mentioned before. Yeah. So we made a call, uh, about 12 months ago to, uh, move all, as we were doing. So we're very much concentrate. I step back a second. Um, very much concentrated on holistic advice for clients now, no transactional, right? So really only want to, deal with clients that we can build a long-term relationship with now that yeah. might be right or wrong for some people for us we believe that's right for us okay. um, and as part of that process um we'll, we'll charge our normal fee structure whatever that mm -hmm. bucket they fit into yeah uh, and if we're doing obviously insurance as part of that holistic advice uh, i'm sort of of the belief that we shouldn't be getting an extra clip on the insurance right so We've decided with those, for those clients to dial down those commissions to zero. Now, yep. what that mean, means for a lot of clients is that uh, you're getting somewhere between a 30% and a 43% discount on premiums for life. Yeah. Depending on who you go with and how you structure it. Um, so like BT at the moment have a 10% platform discount on top of the 30% they normally give. Plus they get a 5% multi-policy discount. So you, you, it works out about 43%. Yep. Now Keith, who's on, who very kindly built us a calculator for that. And what we did in that calculator is try to demonstrate to the client what they'd be saving over a 20 year period if they were mm -hmm. to have this uh, dial down in place. Beautiful. Now, the reality is that actually we then use that saving to say, well, we can put this towards your super, future investments, or do you know what? It just paid for your fees to us for the next 20 years. Perfect. And it's often that much that it does that. So it's quite interesting from that side. Um, and then secondly to that, the we've just started as well doing transactional advice for insurance on fee for service as well. So um, uh, as I say, we don't like transactional advice, but if we do have a walk-in who just wants income protection, yeah. um, we wanted to keep it nice and clean, best interest duty, and just do it on um, fee-for-service. So we charge three and a half grand up front. Yeah. 
and then we charge we dial down all the commissions and then we charge five hundred dollars per life insured ongoing flat fee okay which and can be turned off by the client at any point and uh how many uh, have you found it how have you found it going well we've done about four now to be honest there's not that many on the or just on the transactional side that is yep. um and i think once you put the savings in front of them it becomes a very very easy conversation and equation okay. Beautiful. So for that purpose, it tends to work okay. well. Okay. So it's, it's dial down thing is really, okay. That's perfect. Hey, uh, I want to cover off on some of the questions and I do want to get around to uh, two topics, which is the networking thing and yep. the licensing thing, but let's give two minutes just on this. Cause this has come up a couple of times. Can you talk a bit about the differentiators between your packages and your view uh, as Glenn asked about, you know, what, what do you do to build a really, first class client experience when you're through your servicing. So let's start with the first one. What are the key differentiators between your packages? Uh, so differentiators would be really a uh, uh, number of times we meet the clients, uh, the, the number of entities that we're actually giving advice upon, um, whether they have any sort of uh, abnormal, I say abnormal, uh, unusual investments or stuff that sits outside the normal realms of investing that would, that would factor into it as well. Yeah. Um, they're, they're the real key ones. So the classic is, you know, him and her, they have a self-managed super fund and they might have an investment trust as well. They're going to probably yeah. be in that top bracket, right? Okay. Um, mum and dad retirees just in pension drawdown phase, uh, on a platform would probably be in the 395 bracket. Yeah. Beautiful. So, um, the 391 fives generally are reviewed once a year, but with a, a number of phone hookups throughout the year as well. Yep. Um, and the sort of 850 ones, they, they have two major reviews a year uh, yeah. and with numerous hookups throughout the year as well. But can I just, just on that, um, yeah. one thing I found really interesting, and I think this is going to be more, uh, more pertinent going forward, is I think the whole thing of annual reviews is, is going to go. Yeah. <laughs> I think with the way the data is being updated live everywhere all the time now, I think the idea of perpetual reviews is probably going to be more the norm I agree. In, in the future. So we're sort of trying to move towards that. We're not there yet. We, we just don't have it where um, we need it to be yet. But. You're going to love the accelerator. <laughs> Good. Yeah. <laughs> That's one of the areas we're going to cover. I'm, I'm giving away some of the content, but you're going to know soon anyway. Uh, we're doing a bit of work in the background to work with Sam Hawke, who was the compliance um, expert about what does a no review look like? Because it's about two things. It's about, well, it's actually about one thing. It's about, there's two things. It's the offer, how you position it. And secondly, it's about how you communicate ongoing. That's the real key. Yeah. So it's going to be good. Yeah, that's good. Um, talk about the, the experience. I mean, how do you, in your view, you know, we, we talk a lot about ongoing service instead of ongoing advice, which is another problem, but how do you make it, you know, take it from just from being a service to an experience. What are the key things that you think are important to do that, that, that have worked for you? Oh, the, the key thing in the last two, well, I say two years, probably more so in the last 12 months has been the, the introduction of videos into our, our world, I suppose. So when I do a review meeting now for a client, after the review meeting, I send them a video yeah. uh, with a summary of the key things we went through. Yeah. Um, even sometimes when so clients email me, Rather than yep. emailing them back, I sometimes send a video now. And I just, yep. if you talk about experience, it's, yep. you've got to provide a service, yes, but you, you want to make it as memorable as possible so you're always front of mind to the client. Um, so right. I think that video is, and I think just people engage better with videos than they do with emails. So I, yep. I, I just think it's, uh, uh, well, you've only got to look at where YouTube is now. Everyone seems to love looking at videos, right? So for us, that's been, the real game changer from an experience point of view going forward. Uh, I think that first six months of the client is really important as well. Yep. So lots and lots of contact with the client in the first six months. Okay. Um, and then um, obviously then linking in that, that at the end of that 12 month, initial 12 months, obviously then spending some really key time with them, not only reviewing what you have done for them, but then obviously, making sure you're, you're planning out what you're going to be doing for them over the next 12 months as well. So past, past and future. Yes. Perfect. So, so I reckon that 12 month mark is a real critical time. Okay. Perfect. Uh, 
Let's talk a bit about your network because you have built up an incredible network and it's, an, it's a, it's a net, like it's not been done. A lot of people network like, <laughs> like they need oxygen, but you've just made it a, a natural part of what you do. You know, a lot of people and you've got this great reputation. Talk to me about how you've built it up. And if someone's out there starting from scratch, but you know, they want to do, uh, you know, be able to, to be able to call on people. Mm. How have you done it? What are the tips? Uh, well, first thing I'll say is my, my wife says it's not networking. You take out the E and put in an O, it's not working. So she, <laughs> so she, she thinks I swan around oh. doing nothing when I'm talking to people. But um, mm. um, I think the key thing for me, I, I, I can't remember who told me this. Sometime, it, it, do you remember? It, it might be a guy by the name of Jim DiCarlo, who was at AXA many, many years ago. And he, he said, you need seven referral sources. You need okay. seven good referral sources. And I said, why seven? Mm -hmm. And I, he says, well, you're going to go through periods where some of them are really active and some of them are not, right? Okay. But if you've always got a couple that are generally pretty active, you're going to have that steady stream of, of referrals, okay. right? So I've always, always I, like, I don't know if it's right or wrong, but it, it sort of works for us. Most of our business has been, been built off the back of referrals um, okay. and, and key partners that we have in place that we've built. So yeah. we've done very little marketing in the last 10 years in terms of where we are. Now, that's great. I, I probably need to learn a bit about marketing at some point. Um, you can help me with that down the line. But, uh, Absolutely. Um, Just got to get your license. License <laughs> better down than we're there. <laughs> um, so f for me, it's been about, um, uh, so let's say you've got seven guys, people that you're particularly interested in. I, I'm a big believer in, uh, I probably make five to 10 calls a week to okay. people generally with no agenda just to see what's going on okay right um and i, I it's not necessarily a coffee catch-up i just phone people just to see what they're up to and what they're okay. doing because i think the critical thing with networks is when anyone talks to that person whoever it is about financial planning you want to be the first thing they think about yeah it's the trigger right and the only way you'll be the first thing you think about is if you're front of mind to them. Absolutely. So for me, it's about, you know, even if I don't see people for a long time, it's maybe you drop them a note through LinkedIn. It's just keeping that relationship bubbling away, mm. even if you've not necessarily got anything to talk to them about. So, <laughs> you know. I think the real benefit of, of marketing, like if you do digital marketing and referral marketing is to think of it as, as an integrated funnel, not as separate different things. I got a call the other day from an advisor who reached out and said, I saw you, I saw you speak there. Then I checked out your YouTube and then I checked out your blog and then I had the next thing I'm giving you a call. And that's and when somebody, you know, when you're top of mind and they can send somebody to your stuff and you know, uh, they know what you're about and they get an, you know, it's all back. It all, um, it all increases the tipping point. Yeah. So I think that's, that's the, yeah, that's a really good insight. And the other thing is just that is, is sort of paying it forward a little bit is, you know, um, knowing what all your referral sources do, knowing what they do well, what they don't do. And, and, and just, uh, you know, if you see, a, you need to speak to this guy, he might be able to help you. And just making those introductions to other people. Yeah. Because then they work out who's introducing them to, you know, so it, it's really about just, it, it's networking by stealth, really yeah it's not being as you say overly overt about it but it's just being in front trying to be in front of as many people as you can in a sort of nice conversational sort of way so that you're front of mind when they think of financial planning right so and the other thing is the currency doesn't have to be leads coming for you or it doesn't no you know, not at all I, it can be anything advice. it can be anything anything so if i think of that person i think they could be helpful to someone else i'll put them in front of them yeah and, and it'll be an email or a voxer or a text message or whatever it be you need to speak to john i think he can help you with this yeah and then, so i do a lot of that and I, I probably you know but i think it does pay dividends down the line and yep. you've got to work on that over a consistent period of time for that to actually pay off but it's certainly i've been doing it for what you know a while a while now and it sort of it certainly pays off now so and get a membership to the scg obviously is the other thing that helps too that does help yeah <laughs> Um, let's, let's talk, uh, let's talk about the transition because uh, about, was it about 12 months ago, you made a decision that you wanted to make a move long before anything to the Royal Commission related. Yeah. Um, talk us a bit about, there's a couple of questions about BT select. There's a couple of questions about how the transition has been. Go yep. freestyle on me. Talk a bit about why, 
what you found out, what you found out in the research process, what you're finding out now, and you know your biggest three insights from self-licensing. Okay, so I'll go back a bit further. The genesis of this was probably pre-FOFA. Um, and I, I, we were looking at our self-licensing pre-FOFA, but we decided not to move at that point because of what was going on in the industry at that point. I thought it would be, <laughs> I, I ridiculously thought it'd be better to be part of a bigger licensee okay with the, with the whole fofa change is gone and look to be honest if you want to be it probably was helpful to have all okay. that information from people with deeper pockets that do all the research for you mm -hmm. fast forward 12 months ago we said no look, we really need to now I, i'm i'm sort of very interested in the independent space i think that's something that will ultimately grow i mean but to yeah. actually meet the section you know 923a is almost impossible Yep. Um, and there's only 128 independent advisors in Australia right now. So, yep. um, so, but I think the key for us was control um, and client perception. Mm -hmm. I, I think was really really important for us. Okay. A and really being able to say to clients, you know, you know, we are your fiduciary advisor. We will sit. You know, we are completely product agnostic. We don't, you know, we don't even care if we don't recommend a product. We'll just give you some strategy. I uh, just really wanted to be on their side of the table. Uh, uh, so that, that was really the genesis of it and why we wanted to move to our own license. Okay. Um, fast forward, obviously, we put our application in uh, towards the end of last year. Got the mm -hmm. license in February, February the 22nd. Okay, so, so application... 128 days, I think it was, or something like that. So, um, uh, and... And for a movie. Yeah, and, and when I put the app... When I, so just to go back to just before the application, obviously we'd spent a fair bit of time researching what we were going to do from an application point of view and what we were going to okay. do from... Who we're going to partner up from a compliance point of view. I think if you've not done this process before, and I hadn't, I think there is a lot of value in having someone help you through this process. Whether you continue with them ongoing, I think is up to whomever it is that's making that decision. But I think initially it takes a lot of burden off you as the advisor. Okay. So we looked at a few, but we ended up um, going with BT Select. Okay. Uh, and that uh, for us was based on the fact that uh, we actually got recommended by someone else uh, to okay. have a look at them. But that, you know, they've got some very big practices they look after. So, that, so the William Bucks of this world and the Pitcher Partners, and they've got some you know, one and two man bands. So they do really, you can really benefit from the knowledge from those bigger companies in that sort okay. of dealer group setting. But of course it's not really a dealer group because you're not under one license, you're all under your own licenses. So. Okay. Um, Beautiful. But I, I would say the planning of the light, you know, the, the stages you've got to go through is, is imperative. Um, we've done a lot of planning before BT Select came on, um, but they have been really quite helpful in, in helping us plan through the transition. Got it. And were there any particular resources other than obviously them? Uh, were there any resources around documentation or guides that you found really, really useful? So, um, well, actually, the application stage, we used someone to do the application for us. We used a company by the name of Catalyst Compliance to do that, uh, Peter Cashel over there. Um, he's ex ASIC, so he sort of gets the process. Um, you know, what you should say in submissions, what you shouldn't say, um, the way you, way you word submissions to ASIC, the way you answer questions that come back from ASIC, um, all of that, I think, is, and it cost, I'll tell you exactly what it cost. It cost, I think it cost seven grand, right? But it was worth every penny, in my opinion. So Beautiful. Any other tips? Are anyone thinking of doing it? What are, the, you know, what are the, 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 the big mistakes to avoid or the big things to definitely do to shortcut the process if possible? Probably read a little bit more about PI runoff cover before you get into the... <laughs> the <laughs> <laughs> so... For those of you who don't know, who I haven't been talking to, um, we had a bit of a stumbling block at the end, which took five weeks to solve. 
when yep. AMP were trying to get us to pay seven years worth of runoff cover coming off the back of the license. Yeah. I told them that I wasn't going to pay it. So, um, look, we, we won. That's good. So we had a bit of a battle there at the end. So I, th I think just knowing those hurdles, um, and that just comes from talking to people that have done it before. And yep. that some stuff you, you just, you're never going to see coming. That's okay. That's just okay. the way it is. But I think the more people you can talk to that have done it, I think the, that would be my, my advice is just talk to loads of people about who've yeah. been through the process because you'll pick up one or two things from each of them. And if you can then plug that into your process, you'll pretty much sail through. Love it. This has been incredibly useful. We've covered off a whole, a whole bunch of stuff. As you can see, I've covered wow. a whole full of page stuff. Um, I guess what I really want to ask is, um, like, where are you at now? What's the, what's the biggest um, the thing you're most proudest of having achieved along this timeline? And what are you working on now? Um, I, think the, I, think any, I think any business that's still in business after 14 years should be proud of just still being in business, to be perfectly honest. If you look at yep. the stats, it's, 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 a, it's remarkable that all of us are still in business full stop, which is good, right? So, um, look, very, very proud of where we are and where the team is right now and really really looking forward to the next stage and mm -hmm. it's interesting when you're trying to work out that next stage is especially with the royal commission and where that's gone i think the whole dealer group uh independent licensing all of that is all up for grabs at the moment i think it's going to be really interesting to see whether where where that all falls yeah and, and where it ends up I, i've had a belief for some time that i don't think the dealer group thing really works and i i think it's going to change um, I actually think if, if you want to learn from a profession, and I'm not saying they do it right all the time, but I actually think we're going to end up probably building a business where it looks a bit like a law firm or an account, mm -hmm. whereby you have partners that buy in and junior partners that come out. And I think that is probably where the financial planning firm should end up. Uh, it, it's a tried and tested structure that lawyers and accountants have used. And it, it makes a lot of sense from a transition point of view and makes a lot of sense from a, a growth point of view. So I, I agree with you up to one point, James. And that is yeah. the one thing that uh, you, when you need a lawyer, <laughs> it's usually because of things happening uh, outside of your control. And as an advice business, uh, we actually need, the, the game is to get people to do something financially a little bit earlier. So I agree that there, there's definitely, um, there's a definite attractions to the professional model. Yeah. It's just, you know, if you look at like law path, for example, over here, there are disruptors who are doing to law firms. Um, but yeah, point, yeah, point yeah. taken. I think you're just going to, the bottom line is I think the one man band, I think is going to struggle. I think you're going to have to have a little bit of scale going forward, whatever the structure is, whatever you work on to, to be able to, to do what you need to do. So what's next? What are you working on right now? So we're continuing with the fee for service on the insurance stuff. Uh, the holistic yep. uh, offerings are, are, are still happening. We're still uh, we're still having the technical tech discussions that we continue to have. The tech yep. stack, as you call it, I think you call it, or something I along do. those lines. Um, and I, I'm guilty of all those sort of things when it comes to tech. But I, I actually do think that it's going to be all about client experience going forward. And, and on top of that, a layering practice efficiency. So that's what we're trying to do is get the experience bit right at the front end um, and get the, the actual efficiency uh, right at the back end so we can actually have more uh, more more clients per advisor, right? So yeah, totally. that's where we are. Um, so that's what we're working on right now. So if you've, got, if you've got a business where people actually want to join you and stick around and you combine it with a model on the back that enables you to be highly profitable, Sure. It's literally the best of both worlds, win-win. Um, James, thank you so much. Uh, mate, it's been an absolute a pleasure to do this webinar, and it's, it's been really interesting to kind of go through all the elements because I think we've, we've probably known each other for the at least, actually, probably the majority of this, right? If not quite, long, quite a long time, yeah. I so. think as we met at that stand at the SPA conference. All <laughs> That's right. That's right. Um, um, if people wanted to find out more about what you do or even, you know, potentially uh, they're listening to this and they've got, I don't know, the clients who potentially you, they think may be relevant for you or whatever it might be. What, how can they, what are you working on? How, what would you like people to sort of pay attention to or what, what could they do to sort of connect with you further? Um, well, look, please, I'm pretty open, as you know. So if anyone's got any queries or questions, they can just give me a ring or drop me an email. Happy to answer any questions people have got. 
Um, but I think the, the key takeaway is really about, I think holistic advice is where it's got to be for clients going forward. I think it's, uh, uh, for us, that's what it's going to be about. It's going to be building a truly holistic uh, experience for clients from an advice point of view. So Beautiful. Uh, look, I'd love to get a bit of feedback from everybody on the, uh, on, he's, on, he's still, on, still on here, Jeff, Elizabeth, Glenn, Jeffrey. What's been the most useful insight you take from this? Mainly because I know, you know James has a very fragile sort of self-esteem, so I want to give him sort of something to sort of make his Friday amazing. Isn't that right? That's right. Thank you. Appreciate and, that. And uh, yeah, is there anything else, like um, anything else you'd like people, actually let, answer this question while people are typing in the box. If there was one thing that you would want everybody in the industry to stop doing and to start doing instead, what would it be? Uh, probably entitlement. I mm. think I think a lot of advisors feel they're entitled to the commissions they receive and entitled to what was what happened before. And I just don't think the world works like that anymore. I, I think, you know, what was was and you've got to move forward from that. Um, and that, that's the big thing for us. I mean, if I lose a client, it's, you know, I often blame myself for it. And that's okay because at the, at the end of the day, you've got to be making sure you're putting new clients on at the top end in terms, of, in terms of your new model, your new experience that you're going to provide them. So, um, yeah, entitlements probably stop feeling entitled. Cool. Elizabeth, Jeff, Glenn, Jeffrey, Keith, Nina, this is your chance to pop in the box. What's the one thing that you've taken from today, one insight that you can – Grab, run with, put into your business. Let me know. Uh, we're not going to close it off until we do. What's up for the rest of the day while we wait for the feedback? I've got another hook up, phone hook up in a minute. Uh, and then okay. I'm, I'm into the city this afternoon to catch up with a couple of people. Uh, I won't tell you who. But <laughs> no, okay. there's, a couple, there's a couple of people. Um, and then try and get Thanks. home before five, if I can. Perfect. Out at the country manor. Yes. Yeah, so, well, I was up early this morning. My middle one was swimming this morning. So, yeah, he gets in yeah. the port at five o'clock. It's too early. So. My absolute condolences on Thank the you. fact that you have a, anybody who's into swimming. Uh, <laughs> it's horrible. Rachel, isn't it? it is horrible. Rachel was swimming back in the day. She was telling me. Uh, Glenn says, "Great work. Seeing what other people are doing. That's working. Learning from others. We're all on a learning and improvement journey. It'll never be perfect, but it'll be better. That's actually a really good philosophy. We should put that on a T-shirt or yeah, or, yeah. It's good. I like that. So." Perfect. Okay. I assume that uh, it's been great. Is there anything else I need to do? Is there anything else I need to do or you need to do? I, I think that's a question for you. Is it Grish wants to know, is there anything else you feel you need to do? Um, there's lots. There's always mm. stuff to do. It's, yeah. As I say, it's never going to be perfect. Um, uh, as I say, we, we, we just keep uh, chipping away uh, and trying to make the processes, the client experience, the efficiencies, you know, each department within the business better and better and better so it, it's a living breathing changing morphing beast love it jeffrey says it's reinformed that charm is a lost art but you've got bags of it sir <laughs> that's very nice of you it's so, true. so true yeah you are you're a charming charming man <laughs> if you just tell my wife that would be nice <laughs> elizabeth said it was good to find out about your whole process and re early starts hers hers was rowing so it gets oh, better. There you go. Yes. The row is the same, aren't they? So, so. James, I'm going to let you go because we've run Thanks, over, mate. but uh, this is awesome. If anyone wants to catch up with uh, or, or send in, uh, more information, I think the email is support at millhaven.com.au. Yep, Shoot fine. it through and it'll find its way to James. But otherwise, thank you so much for the webinar today. Pleasure. Um, and Thanks, enjoy everyone. the rest of Friday. Enjoy. See you soon. Thanks. Take care, everyone. See ya. Bye. Bye.